Bunch of ridge runners, get the lead out. Buona fortuna, amici. Good luck. It's easy. Let's see if I'm missing an uncommon. In the closing months of 1944, forward units of the American Fifth Army were faced with the task of breaking through these ridges of the German Gothic defense line. On November 26th of that year, a deathly silence settled over this sector of the Italian front. For it was on that day that our third attempt to break the line failed. The story born out of that stalemate is the subject of this film, told from the personal viewpoint of those who were there. My name is Bill Putnam. I was a lieutenant with the 85th. My name is George Weibel. I was a sergeant assigned to a transport unit. I witnessed the end of the war in Italy. My name is Ben Bush. I was a sergeant with the 86th. I am Hans George Hildebrand. I was a German general in northern Italy. My name is George P. Hayes. I was a commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division. This is the story of the climb to glory. A combined German, American, and Italian account of the combat record of one of America's most unusual fighting outfits. The 10th Mountain Division. certain that words would never be capable of describing what happened here. But time has a way of helping a man put a lot of jagged memories back together again. But we were not the first division to come to Italy, nor did we, as one reporter put it, win the war single-handed. I have no doubt that our final story would have been a lot different had it not been for so many other people who had come here before us. We were not responsible for the victories at Anzio, Salerno, or Monte Cassino, or for the march into Rome. We were still in the States in those days. I believe it was Ernie Pyle who called it the Forgotten Front. We became a part of this tragic scenery on December 23rd, 48 hours before Christmas, 1944. We checked into Livorno exactly one month and one day after the Germans beat back our third attempt to scale their Gothic line. We were given lots of straw to bed down so that we could have insulation from the cold. And it seemed like a wonderful place because the sun was warm. We were well dressed, we were being fed very well, we had lots of time to ourselves, and the idea of the front lines or warfare seemed very far away. We were a peculiar assortment. Our rank and file was made up of Austrian and German Schussboomers, Olympic ski champions, European and American mountain climbers, and what today's generation would probably refer to as Ivy League double domes. Harvard, Dartmouth, and Yale were well represented. An intelligence officer reported that the Germans were not impressed. 
On the 8th of January, this first contingent moved north through Florence to face the deadlock at the front. Ten days later, the rest of the division pulled into Livorno. We had come up from Naples uh, on landing craft and were camped in a uh, park. Uh, there were the whole division was there uh, except for parts of the 86th that were ahead of us and had been in the line. It was raining. Things were rather miserable and soggy, but. Uh, we were cleaning our equipment, uh, relaxing a bit, getting uh, rested up from the long trip in the ocean. It was wet, muddy, and uh, the foxholes that they had dug were full of water and very unpleasant. So they were quite anxious, I think, to get on with the show and get something moving. On February 4th, we were ordered my platoon plus one rifle platoon from the three rifle companies of our battalion into a makeup company that was supposed to do something. We weren't really sure what we were supposed to do. Uh, but uh, we had orders to go up the valley to our left and ascend the ridge that overlooked the town of uh, Pian Sinatico. We did this. We uh, got up to the top of the ridge in fairly good order, uh, and I put my uh, mortars in position to shell the town of Pian Sinatico, uh, and uh, we then waited for something to happen. Kurt, now come the armies from hinten. It happened. We did some damage to the town of uh, Piancinatico, but uh, it was all done with uh, my mortars, uh, the 60 millimeter mortars of uh, a line company. Uh, I remember rather enjoying the performance because uh, we were actually doing something. Uh, we felt uh, constructive. Uh, I'm sure the Germans had a different attitude, but we could see some Germans uh, in the town, and uh, I did my own observing, calling the, uh, the shots and, uh, to create maximum damage. You, you can't really do a great deal of damage uh, against uh, uh, buildings with, with 60 millimeter mortars, but I tried. And I remember seeing, praying, just hoping I could uh, drop one round down the chimney of the building that uh, I was sure was their, uh, their headquarters. And we knocked an awful lot of tiles off the roof first, but I finally got one round right smack down that chimney. I felt so good to see the the flames and smoke shoot out the windows and the door. It was a, a glorious feeling. Uh, I guess it was uh, really the only satisfying event of the whole day for, for any of us on that, uh, that raid. For it was then that someone turned the tables on us. First I thought it was maybe our own artillery. But it was our friends down below lobbing shells all over the stupid ridge. For some of us, it was our first experience under fire wasn't very pleasant. Then a funny thing happened. We couldn't get enough of us to move out of the way. I kept wondering why the officer in charge didn't move, but no one budged. But the moment I got hit, everybody cleared out. Uh, why, leading the parade down was the guy in charge of the foolish raid, uh, and I never saw anybody move so fast in all my life, uh, as he did getting out of there after the... Uh, the hours that I'd spent urging him to do something, and... The end of the first skirmish. Confusion, fear, a wounded man. Just a sample of what life on the line could be like. There may have been more than one man who wished he had stayed in Livorno. A communique from the front read, The sector immediately south of the German Gothic line was relatively quiet today. Another report simply stated that the Germans had been observed digging in. Six days later, on the 11th, elements of the 86th Regiment began probing into enemy territory, looking for ways in which the 10th might gain access to some of the heights the Germans held. No one made much noise about those patrols. There was no mention of them in the press. 
We lost men on some of these patrols. And you know, a guy that's killed on patrol is just as dead as a guy that's killed in the big push. Within three weeks of their arrival in Livorno, all remaining elements of the 10th that had been limbering up in rear areas began moving up to their pre-assault positions in and around the town of Vidichatico. They passed men who had already been at the front. We naturally spoke to them, eager to find out what battle was like, what combat was like, what bullets were like. And I remember how they told us about the horror that they had experienced how death actually came to many of their comrades, how they narrowly escaped death, how they were wounded and they would never go back under any circumstances. Here was the situation at the front as General Hayes saw it from his command post. On my left is Riva Ridge and on my right is Mount Belvedere. And on the right of Mount Belvedere is Mount Gorgolesco. Between Belvedere and Riva Ridge, that small humpback ridge was also held by the Germans. As you can see, the Germans had observation on all of our front and was essential to capture Riva Ridge to prevent them from looking down in our flank and rear when we attack Mount Belvedere. The thing that disturbed me most in, uh, in preparing for the attack was assembling the division in this sort of a punch bowl surrounded by the mountains that the Germans held. They had observation on the whole area that the division would have to uh, come into to prepare for the attack. Now, I felt quite sure if the Germans found out that the whole division was assembling in that area, that they would reinforce their troops and make it much more difficult. So the problem, uh, first problem that I faced was try to slip the division in at night. The American line runs from here down to this valley in northeast of Rocca Corneta. We haven't got any reporters yet on their exact whereabouts on the western flank. Now, I've ordered out two patrols in strength. They're to capture any American in the 10th Mountain Division sector and return him alive to me, not to the intelligence. Who's in charge? Captain Croner. He's a mountain man himself. That night, an American patrol also went out. Halt die Klappe da hinten und mach das Licht aus. In the dark, they met. That night, no prisoners were taken. The entire division, more than 13,000 men, continued to move into and around the town of Vitachatico. After patrolling uh, for a period of a week, we finally found four little paths that we could climb. We thought we could climb up the mountain. Now they'd had to go up a single file. One uh, German at 
top of the mountain could throw hand grenades down and stop the whole show if we didn't gain surprise. So naturally, under a situation of that kind, the man would be a little nervous. You couldn't expect him to be otherwise. And there was Mount Belvedere, serenely majestic, covered with landmines, and for the fourth time, the prime objective of the coming assault. The first impression of Mount Belvedere from in front of Viticatico was that it was so far, far away and awfully high up. It seemed impossible that we'd ever be able to make that distance and ever be able to capture that mountain. On the 14th of February, General Hayes told his commander, Major General Willis D. Crittenberger, that he was ready to breach the German line and to spearhead the 5th Army's advance into the Po Valley that lay to the north. He was given the green light. On the 15th of February, General Hayes dictated this order. The 10th Mountain Division will attack on D-Day to seize occupy, organize and defend the Mount Belvedere, Mount Della Torresia Ridge and prepare for action to the northeast. D-Day and H hour to be announced. The Germans were well aware that something was up, but according to their records, there wasn't much they could do about countering our intentions. General Hildebrand was asked about the obvious absence of German aircraft. You ask about the lack of support by our Air Force? Gentlemen, I can only reply that there were days, well weeks, when I did not see a single German plane. There were many planes up there, but they were yours, gentlemen, not ours. It was extremely frustrating when a British or an American fighter plane made observations of our positions and I had no way of going after it. Some 10th Mountain Division veterans may remember this house. Farmer Giuseppe Lenzi has lived in it all his life. During the tense wait for D-Day that followed the General's combat order, a handful of men of the 86th Mountain Infantry hold up inside Lindsay's house. Giuseppe remembers their arrival and the day they left. In February of 1945, the Americans arrived at the village of Viticatico, most of them from the 10th Division. Then in one evening of that February, they began their advance on Mount Riva and Mount Belvedere, where they started a great battle. As Giuseppe and other farmers watched the troops move out, another man helped guide one of our first probes up the sheer cliffs of Riva Ridge. His name, Gino Lanzi. On the evening of February 19, 1945, the 10th American Division began the seizure, the occupation of Mount Capalbuso. Slowly, slowly, quietly, to surprise the Germans who were sleeping. There are only four places in that ridge that our troops could climb and then only single file and they uh, it was absolutely essential that they get on top of that ridge before the enemy was alerted it was at this point that the division's special talents first came into play expert rock climbers of the first battalion of the 86th began climbing the ridge's jagged rocks to a height of 1,500 feet and, without making a sound, fixed ropes for the use of units that were moving up from below. 
we uh, flashed some searchlights on the cloud formation up above, and that reflected back just a little bit of light on the hill mountainside, which enabled them to see a little bit uh, of the uh, rock structure that they had to climb. All ropes were secured by midnight. The entire valley below was still. Come on, you bunch of ridge runners! Get the lead out! After two hours of combat, there was still no word from the men on top of the ridge. It was reported, however, that the first of several wounded were on their way down. To General Hayes, there were two questions. Would mountain climbers prove to be the answer to the Gothic line? And would their special talents, plus the strategy of surprise, help keep initial casualties down? After midnight, the first indications of success trickled down to the valley below. Company B of the 86th had dislodged all German troops from the top of Rebus Mount Capel Busso. At dawn, a single platoon of Company A reported that it had occupied the northern end of the ridge, Piso di Campopiano. Das ist Campopiano. Bis morgen früh haben wir die Bande runtergeschmissen. Gehen wir! German counterattacks came as expected. They were vicious. But were doomed to failure when a young lieutenant in charge of the lonely platoon checked the German thrust by calling for dangerously close artillery support. By morning of the following day, the ridge was ours. The 10th Mountain Division, still considered green, had chopped the key threat out of the Gothic line. Belvedere was next. In the early morning hours, while initial mopping up operations got underway on Riva Ridge, the 10th let loose with a terrible hail of steel against Gorgolesco and Belvedere. It did not inspire peace of mind in the men who waited below. For the Germans had, after all, overcome that kind of shellacking on three previous occasions. Feindliche Kampfflugzeuge vom Westen im Anflug! Ganz tief! When it seemed as though the hill had died, the 85th and 87th regiments pushed off for the minefields above them. Da kommen sie! Da sie kommen! had two weapons. They had an 88 and they had the burp gun. Of course they had a Luger but uh, that was the kind of thing you got as a souvenir. Uh, the burp gun was something you were afraid of. The 88 was something you, you should be, uh, be definitely concerned with. 
On the morning of the 20th, one whole battalion of the 85th reached the top of Mount Belvedere. But the trick, as they soon discovered, was not just to reach it, but to hold it. As the 87th swung to the northeast to firm up the Belvedere line, evidence of the cost of that action began to show. The Germans rushed the 741st Jaeger Regiment into the line. And the 10th climbed up to meet them. They wept as they crawled, and they screamed, and the Germans who saw them thought they were crazy. And the Germans cried too, some out of pity, some out of fear, and some out of disbelief. By the 22nd, it became obvious to both American and German commanders that the 10th was no ordinary combat outfit. For by that day, it had become clear that it would succeed in holding the objectives assigned to it. News of this relentlessly aggressive outfit spread deep into the German lines. Prisoners revealed that their commanders had called it the Elite Mountain Division. German Sergeant Gerg Weibel was in that combat zone. Ich erinnere mich noch genau. I remember distinctly when I took over a transport unit south of Bologna. I learned that the American Mountain Division pressed upon us. It came as a shock to all of us because we knew very well that this would spell our collapse. On February 24th, Riva was secure. Belvedere was secure. and all initial objectives to the northwest were also secure. Peace returned to Bidichatico. Just an occasional shot could be heard. In a letter of commendation to the division, General Mark W. Clark, commander of the 15th Army Group, said, My congratulations to the officers and men of the 10th Mountain Division. You men have done a damn fine job. General Hildebrand says, I respect this unit, for I fought against it. Your men fought back very well, and you did not make it easy for us. But I believe our men did not make it easy for the 10th Mountain Division either. A soldier's fate, a soldier's duty. Next week, part two of The Climb to Glory. It was on a dark winter night in central Italy that a group of expert GI rock climbers fixed ropes to the side of this mountain, scaled this ridge in absolute silence, and dealt defeat to the Germans who'd been waiting on top. The 10th Mountain Division, fresh from the States and new to combat, had done what others before had for months been unable to do. German field commanders, startled by the speed with which the outfit climbed and moved, called it America's elite mountain division. American commanders noted the compliment and then chose the 10th to spearhead the final push through the German lines. The story of that last assault in Italy is the subject of this film. It will be told by Italian citizens Angelo Maldini, Maria Morotti, and through the personal views and recollections of those who served at the front. My name is Bill Putnam. I was a lieutenant with the 85th. My name and is Franz Hubel. 
I was a German soldier with a heavy artillery unit in Italy. My name is Ben Bush. I was a sergeant with the 86th. My name is Horst Kugelmeier. During the Second World War, I was a corporal with the Mountain Division in Italy. My name is William J. Moran. I was the division chaplain. I am Hans George Hildebrand. I was a German general in northern Italy at the end of the war. My name is George P. Hayes. I was the commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division. This is part two of The Climb to Glory, a combined German, American, and Italian account of the combat record of one of America's most unusual fighting outfits, the Army's 10th Mountain Division. Last traces of the snows of 44 vanished from the Italian soil, the 10th Mountain Division prepared to move north to break through the rest of the German Apennine defense line. One of its immediate objectives was the once quiet town of Castel Diano. Innkeeper Angelo Maldini lives there today. The story of the 10th uh, American Mountain Division in Castellano, it began on uh, March the 3rd, 1945. There are many people at Castellano who remember that day. The American 10th Mountain Division could be seen coming through the valley. They had two objectives. Looking south on the right, the town of Castellano, and on the left, Monte della Spain. The Germans were well entrenched. They were ready for them. We had eight months of front lines. In those eight months, they tore down all the houses at Castle Diano. There wasn't one covered. There were also some dead. And then the Germans took from the houses all they could take. But when the Americans arrived, they gave us things to eat. And, well, we lived a little better. Castel Diano, once again, was secure and was given back to its own people. Three days after the battle started, Monte del Espe was also secure. Some never knew the name of the place. They were left behind in the stillness that enveloped that mountain town. It was a bloody battle. The people here were glad when it was over. But the sadness that all wars bring can still be felt in these hills. The division paused to wait for its supply lines to catch up. And the men prepared for the next offensive. During this relative respite from battle, routine patrolling continued. The 10th Mountain Division will attack from positions on Mount Dulles Bay. The 85th Mountain Infantry will be on the left, the 87th on the right, the 86th Mountain Infantry will mop up the right half of the objective assigned to the 87th. This is what some men saw from their positions. Veterans of the campaign will remember that distant peak as the Rocca Rofino and the lump to its left as the ridge of Mount Pignum. Held by the Germans, it marked the last major defense of their once touted Gothic line. Mount Pigna, too sheer to climb, 
would have to be captured at night from behind. This was done in a matter of hours. Rofino would have to be taken head on by day. Rocco Rafina's attack began very early in the morning at dawn. And we were starting from a high ridge, looking down a valley. We weren't to start until after all the preparations had been readied, so that we had a beautiful view in a beautiful day, bathed in sunlight of the valley, the mountain, and everything around it. This was in the spring, and we were waiting for the beginning of the air attack. Before long, the planes came overhead, and it was a pleasure to see them diving down toward the mountain. And as they screamed down the mountain and turned on their way up, you'd see a release of flame that would reach almost to the sky. A napalm bam released. The fire lasts a long time because of the jelly that spreads along the mountains. And the rate of burning seemed to be terrific. Everything seemed to be in flame. And as plane after plane peeled down, let go its bomb, and more and more flame reached up in the sky, it seemed as if nothing, nothing that was alive could ever survive that fire. And when everything had been finished and everything had been done, and there seemed nothing more for us to do than just walk over. Just walk over leisurely and take the ground, and it was ours. Then everything came right back at us. Everything and more. Once again, silence surrounded the valley as the tent moved out. And the Germans watched them come. And they wondered how this elite division would ever cross this open terrain and climb to this incredible height. Twenty meters too short. Twenty meters too short, man. Too wide. Ten meters too short and fire. Und noch fünf zurück. Und noch mal. Und noch mal. Few people will remember the name of this mountain hamlet below the Rocca Rufino. But it's where a number of Americans discovered that there were a number of Germans who were unwilling to throw in the towel. Further resistance ended when General Hayes sent a fresh battalion in from behind and surrounded the town. The 10th now fixed eyes on the ridges above and moved in to tackle the Roca Rufino. We müssen Granatwerfer anfordern. Mensch, die kommen unter unsere Feuerlinie durch. Ich kann nicht anrufen. Unsere Leitungen sind alle abgeschnitten. A German corporal remembers what happened next. His name, Horst Kugelmeier. Unten im Tal sperrte uns ein heftiges Artilleriefeuer zum Rückzug ab. Down in the valley, there was heavy artillery fire, which made it impossible for us to retreat. And in front of us, there were the Americans. We gave in to what was inevitable, threw our weapons away, walked toward the Americans, raised our hands and did exactly as the pamphlets had told us to do, to surrender. We expected hostile reactions, but, well, one becomes a prisoner of war only once in life. The Americans searched us for weapons, ordered us to sit down, and suddenly, it was rather funny at the moment, there came an American sergeant, and he asked in German where we came from. We said, 
We are from Munich. And he remarked that he knew Straubing. They offered us cigarettes. And suddenly, all of us were sitting together. Americans and Germans next to each other. And we smoked cigarettes. Our canteen went around. We still had some cognac in it. And I had the feeling that suddenly there was peace. By nightfall, the Rocca Rufino was secure. But the Germans continued to harass the new arrivals with accurate mortar fire. And so, for some people, the battle ended on a different note. I was awfully tired that night. And sleepy, too. But I think most of all I was thirsty. It had been a hot climb up Rocca Rufino. Dusty. Tired. And the water gave out awfully soon. But here it was past midnight. And I was on my way down to pick up replacements. No water in the canteen. Nothing to drink. And even though the evening was cool, my throat was parched and thirsty. My legs were given out. I stumbled away down. How I ever got there, I'll never know. And the backlight, that eerie light... Orange flames licking out of the treetops, out of the little houses. Red flames, too. The whole forest, the whole mountain was dying. With that wonderful, eerie light. And I was just making my way down, hoping I'd find them. Hoping I'd find my way back. Without any mines, without any shells, without anybody being hit. Every now and then a gun would go off. Not often. I guess the Germans were tired, too. Well, they would go off once in a while. Not enough to scare me. And then when I found them, and we started the way back, I was even more tired then. More tired. I stumbled forward, up to find my place where we were before. And suddenly, there was nothing. A huge light. A red light. I was enveloped in the light, and I was floating. I was floating on my back, and I was saying to myself, so this is what it's like to be dead. So this is what it's like to be dead. So this is what it's like to be dead. It wasn't bad. I didn't feel a thing. I was floating in the air. Suddenly I landed. I could only tell I landed because it started hurting. I must have landed. I began to hurt all over. And the mortar fire began. And the men came running over, leaning over me, hiding me, acting like an umbrella to save me, putting a blanket around me. Even then I began to think, boy, first aid, first aid for shock. I didn't care. Just too tired to move. I didn't care what happened. The division took a great many casualties in breaking through and securing the heights which you see in front of you. The 10th Mountain Division had finally cleared the last obstacle in its drive to capture the Po Valley below. The Germans, tossed off the Apennines for good, began rolling north in the hope of slowing the Allied advance at two river crossings. The first at Bomporto. The other farther north at the town of San Benedetto. It was no secret that the Germans would try to destroy all the bridges. The 10th would attempt to prevent this from happening. Brigadier General Robinson Duff, second in command, was assigned to this mission. I gave Robbie Duff uh, a battalion of infantry mounted in trucks some uh, uh, light tanks and reconnaissance units and told him to bypass any resistance he ran into and move as rapidly as he could down to the Bombardo bridges and capture them intact. I told him, never mind the Germans that he ran into, to go around them, that the rest of the division would come along behind and mop them up. 
Miraculously, the Germans were outrun. The bridge at Bomporto was captured intact. The rest of the division, racing up from behind, overran so many Germans that for a moment it looked as though the advance might be stopped by the simple burden of figuring out what to do with so many prisoners. General Hayes solved the problem by stationing MPs, ten miles apart. The MPs then waved these war-weary men into hastily erected enclosures. Chaplain Moran, in convoy up at the front, remembers taking part in these proceedings. Just before the, we moved from the Apennine Mountains into the Po Valley, I had an unusual and rather rare experience. That is, rare and, a, and unusual for a chaplain. I was returning from a, an aid station with my driver, my jeep driver, and we were coming down a country lane in this farmyard when suddenly two Germans jumped out in front of the jeep. At first, we thought they were going to engage us in combat, but we noticed that he did not have any weapons. However, one of them did have something that looked like a hand grenade, but on closer examination, we found that it was a, a can of uh, rations. We came to a sudden halt, of course, and with that, they put up their hands and said the words kaput, meaning they wished wish to surrender. Unusual as this was, and unfamiliar as I was with this procedure, I, however, put the two prisoners in the back of my jeep and proceeded towards the main road. On the main road, we joined in with the stream of traffic that was going back and forth, and as we went down the uh, road, we noticed a number of soldiers standing on the side, and as other prisoners and other vehicles went by, they made certain remarks to them, uh, always in a jolly mood, of course. But uh, as I went by, with the division chaplain written on my jeep, I heard one soldier say, with an expletive, even the chaplain gets them. Farther north, however, there were still German units determined to make a last-ditch stand. General Hayes remembers that it was in this action that he lost his second in command. It was then about nine o'clock at night. After we got straightened out and started again toward the Po, uh, Robbie Duff saw a mine lying in the middle of the road, and he ran over to the tank that was uh, advancing on this mine and rapped on the door, trying to tell them to stop and not run over the, the mine. Unfortunately, they ran over the mine just as he got to it, and that wounded him. Just a few miles away, the Germans were making a desperate attempt to get to the other side of the Po. Their retreat was costly. Private Franz Hubel was there. We had to leave the wounded behind, and only those who found some means or material could save their lives. We crossed the Po on trees, trunks, on telephone poles, car tires, and whatever else we had at our disposal. The physical and mental efficiency of the German soldiers at that time was at its lowest point, and everyone hoped that the war would soon be over. General Hildebrand remembers it this way. There was a shortage of everything, of ammunition, of gasoline, of reinforcements, of tanks, and above all, aircraft. Nevertheless, gentlemen, a demoralization of the troops did not occur. Our men at the front did their duty to the bitter end. That night, the 10th arrived at the pole. Well, the next morning, I went down and looked at the pole, across the pole with my field glasses, and I could see that 
The dike on the other side was all prepared for defense. They had uh, uh, foxholes vetted in the... And uh, as far as I could see, there were no infantry over there. And I thought, well, we'd better get across before the German infantry come and man uh, those defenses. So I planned the crossing with the 87th Infantry making the initial crossing at high noon. It was warm and sunny, I believe, although we didn't much care about the scenery or the type of day. Uh, we had to cross up over the dike, and uh, things were rather uncomfortable because the Germans had some uh, anti-aircraft batteries on the, on the north side of the river, uh, a few miles upstream, and they were shelling us all the way across with time bursts, which uh, exploded right over us uh, as we were in the field next to the river and as we were crossing. Once we got across the river, we could, uh, we could spread out and uh, escape from this uh, murderous uh, type of artillery. So we did. At the same time, Bill Putnam remembers taking note of a sad realization. It was the day we crossed the Po River. Ahead of me in the crossing had been Company L of the 87th. I spent the happiest perhaps days of, of my army life uh, in that company as a private and I knew all the people in that company. When we crossed the Po, they were, they'd stopped ahead of us and my company uh, crossed through theirs and I only recognized two people. Beyond the pole, the 10th Mountain Division got fresh supplies, captured the town of Verona, and a few hours later lost its assistant division commander, Colonel William O. Darby, to a German shell. He received the rank of Brigadier General after his death. The 10th rolled north to Lake Garda and took to the water to capture the tunnels on both sides of the lake. And it left friends behind as the fading war claimed its very last victims. It fought for the town of Torbalim and silenced resistance on the northern shore. It battered the Germans out of their last mountain stronghold. It cleared the Adige line and then held the Germans at bay. My lieber Sohn. My dear son, it appears that it won't last much longer in these murderous hills. Don't be sorry when I say we have lost, for that is the bitter fact. We no longer have any hope of stopping this incredible turn of events. I write this to you certain that no censor would be so foolish as to disagree with these words at this late hour. We will surrender when we can. We have been left no other course, no ridge, no peak, no height seems safe enough. We have been followed into the very heavens. We took the town of Riva. The war was over. At the war's end, General George P. Hayes stood on the bank of Lake Garda, faced his troops, and said, When you soldiers go home, no one will believe you when you start 
telling of the spectacular things you have done, there have been more heroic deeds and experiences crammed into these days than I have heard of. I have been privileged to participate in many actions that were considered important and fierce battles. And I can assure you that one of the most bitter were the ones that we fought right here. Many times we stuck our neck out with exposed flanks. At one time we were 20 miles in advance with both our flanks exposed. The Lord held us by the hand. And then bells pealed in a thousand towns, and for a moment time stood still as the world readjusted. And then it was no more than a memory, a memory of gunfire and mountains and of those who had died between Belvedere and Lago di Garda. Their memory will ever be with us. Those who for a year or more, for a few months perhaps, were our friends, our comrades. And we feel that we have thy divine approval when we say that we are proud to be with them, members of the same unit, the same army, the same commonwealth. And as we stand this day in the final moments of remembrance, under the same sun and same sky under which our comrades worked and prayed and fought and played so well, we pray to thee, our sovereign God, that under the same sun and sky they may find repose, rest everlasting, and life eternal. A soldier's Valhalla, their reward. May they rest in peace.